Well, if you have a Bible, open to Revelation 21. There is a story about a preacher who was preaching from this very passage one Sunday morning, and he preached through the sermon, and he reached this climactic conclusion. And he said to the congregation, if you want to go to heaven, stand up. And of course, everyone in the room immediately jumped out of their feet, or not out of their feet, up to their feet. They jumped out of their seat onto their feet, <laughs> except for one person. Down in the front row to the right was a little boy about 11 years old who stayed in his seat. The preacher was perplexed, so he looked over at the boy and asked him, Son, why aren't you standing up? Well, the boy, he, and then he said, Don't you want to go to heaven when you die? And the boy jumped out of his seat and said, When I die, well, yeah, I thought you were getting a group together to go now. <laughs> Be honest, have you ever felt like that? The next to the last sentence in the book of Revelation is found in verse 20. And it simply says, Come, Lord Jesus. You know, there are days when we feel like screaming that from the top of our lungs. Those days where things don't seem to go well or, and bad experiences pile on top of uh, one another and struggles seem to pile upon struggles. It's one of those uh, kind of like the old commercial, the cow gone take me away moments where you're just like, I got to get out of here. And so we do. We have these come Lord Jesus moments. And then there are days when our sentiment is a little bit more like this, that it's, come Lord Jesus, just not yet. I kind of like what's going on here, God. I, I, I want to I hang out here a little bit longer. I want to see how this life plays out. I'd like to, 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 to stick around just a little bit. And, and you see, I think we have a bit of a problem. And it, I think it might just be a vision problem. The Bible says in Colossians 3 that we are to set our hearts and minds on things above and not on earthly things. If you think about it, this really should be a no-brainer and something that happens naturally. I mean, if we're talking about, we are talking about the difference here between the things of God and the things of man. We're talking about the difference between the completely perfect and the completely incomplete. We're talking about the difference between the eternal and the temporary. I mean, we're talking about the world God intended and the world we actually live in. The Bible study that Lindy talked about, one of the things we, we mentioned in that first week was the, the, the big story of God and how it all started out. You remember that big story. In Genesis 1, God created the heavens and the earth. In the first five days, he created the, the day and the night, the sky and the sea, the land and all that grew on it, the sun, the stars and the moon, the fish and the birds. And then on day six, he created the creatures of the land. And in his image, he created man and woman. And God took a step back and he saw that it was very good. And the world was in perfect harmony, and God and mankind had this unhindered fellowship with one another. But then, then Genesis 3 happened. Sin entered the world, and with it came pain and suffering and decay and death, and worst of all, separation from God. And I don't know about you, but that kind of place seems like a pretty easy place to despise. Think about it. A, a place where people, children even, suffer daily under the pains of poverty and abuse. A place where disease is a daily reality and never more has that been more obvious than right now. A place where continual wars take lives and hate manifests its way, itself in countless ways. A place where death impacts each and every one of us in some way. But somehow, some way, we start to think that that nasty place where all those bad things happen, then maybe it just isn't so bad after all. When I was a kid growing up, there was something evil in the midst of my household. It was, uh, it was we, we despised its very existence. And it was my father's garden. We hated that garden. We hated it because it pulled us as kids from more pleasurable activities like cartoon watching and it took us to the miserable task of watering and weeding and we hated it because we'd spend hours hunched over green bean plants that would lead to sore backs and stinging eyes from the sweat flowing from our heads into our eyes. Even worse was what the garden produced and, and I was okay with most of the pro produce harvested. I liked tomatoes. I didn't mind cucumbers. I love green beans. But there was one particular plant that was nothing more than a vile weed. And that was the yellow squash. 
I loathed this vegetable. I loathed its taste. I hated its texture. It didn't matter how it was prepared. Dad would, would saute it. He would, he would bread it and fry it. There's all sorts of things that he would do with it. It didn't matter. It would always turn my stomach. But in my house, you ate what was being fixed or you went hungry. And so year after year, I choked down the yellow squash. But around the time I was about to graduate high school, something interesting happened. I didn't gag quite as much when I ate that squash. In fact, by the time I graduated high school, I secretly kind of liked it. And then I got married and I realized, hey, I don't have to eat anything I don't want to eat anymore. And so I went a while without eating a yellow squash, but all of a sudden I found myself craving it. And so you know what? That evil garden and that vile weed had become a part of my household by choice. In fact, up until a few years ago, we too would persecute our children with backbreaking garden work. And yes, one of the main plants in our garden was the yellow squash. I think that's what happens a lot of times with this broken world that we live in. That We, we start out, we tolerate it. We don't really like it, but we're stuck in it, so we sort of tolerate it. We have to, have to live here. And, and then sort of we, we sort of get used to it. And then, all of a sudden, we even get attached to it. Maybe we become attached to some of the sinful substitutes the world has to offer. There's a lot of substitutes that are sinful, that offer, offer uh, temporary pleasure and empty promises that, that really are just, they seem great at the time. And so, uh, and frankly, those, those things are addictive. And so maybe that's part of the reason we get used to this world and actually get attached to it. Or maybe we just become attached to the temporary joys. There are some really good things that are non-sinful that happen in this world. There's some joy that takes place in this world. Little experiences. But they're temporary. But as we saw with the great prostitute in the earlier chapters of Revelation, as, tract as attractive as sin is, it will lead to our destruction. And we must be careful that we don't hold on to the gifts of God so tightly that they become gods themselves. I'm reminded of Romans chapter 1. We talked about the people, how they had worshipped, created things as if they were the creator. That's what we should not do. And so that could be one reason why we have a hard time setting our hearts and minds on things above, that we just get too attached to the things below. But I think there's another reason we struggle. And it's in this reason that we have our vision problem. It's perhaps the main reason we have a tendency to say, come Lord Jesus, not yet. I think because we have a distorted view of heaven. A few years ago, I checked into a hotel, and when I got into my room, I went into the bathroom, and I saw something that made me chuckle. On the back of the toilet was this, heavenly toilet paper. And it stuck with me because I think it is a great illustration of what we think of when we think of heaven. Isn't this what most people think about when they think of heaven? Clouds and softness and fuzziness and maybe some pearly gates and, and a harp or two. Maybe that's what we think when we think of heaven. It's what uh, movies and cartoons and whatever, that's sort of the picture we've gotten. A while back, somebody posted this on Facebook. It said, someone in heaven loves me. Share if you love someone in heaven. And I don't want to downplay the comfort that we can have from our loved ones who died in Christ being in his presence. I take hope in that personally. But I think that we can be pretty sure that heaven is not some sort of cloud-filled waiting room. And it's not just what the world thinks, it's often what the church teaches as well. I remember as a, as a, a preacher one time when I was a kid saying, if you don't like singing, you ain't going to like heaven. And as a 12-year-old kid who was kind of bored by the music at my church, I thought, oh no, I ain't going to like heaven. And church, when we th forget what eternity is about, there's a couple of things that happen. First of all, we start to live for the here and now. When we forget about eternity, then our focus becomes right in front of our faces. What happens now? What is happening just a couple years down the road? What happens in this life? That's where our focus is then dedicated. But the other thing is that we live with no hope. We live with no hope. Or, perhaps more accurately, we live with misplaced hope. That our hope is placed in things of this world in our own abilities, in our own situations, in our own circumstances. 
And these are the temptations that the churches faced when Revelation was written. The temptation to take their focus off forever and focus it on right now. The, the temptation to take their focus of hope off of something provided by God and put it in something that, that's created or provided by man. And so Jesus ends his revelation to the church with a picture of eternity. And if we are to set our hearts and minds on things above, we need to hear these words with fresh ears and renewed imagination. So before we get into this passage, I want to take a time now to pray. Let's pray. God, I do pray that you'll give us fresh ears to hear your word, fresh eyes to see your perspective, to see eternity as you see it. Help us to get, catch a glimpse of your reality as we read your word today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to read kind of an extended passage out of the book of Revelation. And I've mentioned before, the book of Revelation was meant to be read. It was meant to be heard by congregations. It was meant to be read out loud. It would be passed around from church to church. And so I want to encourage you, rather than following along in a Bible, just, just listen today to the words in Revelation, starting with verse 21, verse 1, or chapter 21, verse 1 going through 22, verse 5. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice on the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and He will dwell with them. They will be His people, and God Himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write these down, this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all of this. I will be their God and they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, sexually immoral, those who practice magical arts, the idolaters and all liars, they will be consumed and consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and the 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and its walls. The city was laid out like a square as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length and as wide and as high as it is long. The angel measured the wall using human measurement. And it was 144 cubits thick. The wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold, as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth ruby, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth turquoise, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was of gold, as pure as transparent glass. I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light and the Lamb its lamp. The nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. No, on no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. The angel showed me the river 
of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Down the middle of the great street of the city, on each side of the river, stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city, and His servants will serve Him. They will see His face, and His name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. Church, I don't uh, believe that any written word can truly capture the glory that we will see in eternity, and I certainly don't believe that I am capable of, to preach a sermon that makes the reality of eternity crystal clear in your mind. And so this morning, I have prayed that the Holy Spirit give us a glimpse of the reality of, of eternity so that we can set our hearts and minds on things above. But I think there are three images that describe eternity in this passage that I think will help us see clearer. First of all is the image of a new paradise. I want you to think of the things that are similar in the old paradise, which was the, the Garden of Eden in Genesis, and the new paradise that we just read about in Revelation. First of all, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 10, we, we read that there's a river that ran through the Garden of Eden. And then in Revelation 22, 1, reads, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And the fact that this is coming from the throne, it shows the eternal nature of this river, that this is the water of life, the water of true life. Then in the Garden of Eden, we had the tree of life. Genesis chapter 2, verse 9 talks about the tree of life. And then Revelation 22, 2 says, On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. Notice that, that there's more than one tree. They're on both sides of the river, and it's even more productive than before. But even better than what is in the new, even better than what is in this new paradise is what is not in this new paradise. We find out that there's no sea in Revelation 21.1. The original audience would have associated the sea with separation and turbulence. And so this is good news. That means peace is here in this new paradise. We read that there's no tears, death, mourning, crying, or pain. Revelation 21.4 says that. Imagine that for a second. Imagine that for a second. I want you to think about maybe what caused tears or pain in your life this week. For me, it was just a couple nights ago. My kids, all big kids, 21, 19, and 17, and then my 10-year-old were all playing like they were three and four years old, laughing, having a good time, wrestling around. And I sat in my chair and I, and I, I teared up. And the reason I teared up is because I know that my 21-year-old is getting married and going off to start a new life. I know that my 19-year-old is going to college, and I'm going to miss her dearly, and it won't be long before the 17-year-old and 10-year-old are out of the house as well, and I miss that separation. But we read even that, even that in the new paradise will be missing. We'll all be together as God intended. We also see that there's no deceit. Revelation 21, 7 says that. Nothing to tempt us from leaving or, or staying away from our God. We see that there are no restrictions to the tree of life. Remember in the original Garden of Eden, there, was, there were some restrictions as to what they could eat or when they could eat it. But there's no restrictions. It's there for, for the taking. And then, of course, there is no curse. We read that in Revelation 22, 3. But I want you to notice one more thing is that you have to notice that we don't go to heaven. Heaven actually comes to us. And so in essence, what God does is finishes his work of redemption, reconciliation, and restoration. God's plan is complete, and heaven and earth are restored to the way God intended. It is paradise. But eternity is also described as a new city. Revelation 21, 2, John wrote that he saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. And I have to tell you that a city has not always been my vision of heaven. I kind of like the city now. I enjoy going to Austin. I enjoy Knoxville, Tennessee. I enjoy Kansas City. I like, I like the urban areas. I like 
the culture of the city. When I was growing up, though, I grew up in northwest Oklahoma with big skies and wheat fields as far as the eye could see. The closest McDonald's for most of my life was 60 miles away, and the closest mall was 72 miles away. When we talked about going to the city when I was growing up, it meant we were going to go to Oklahoma City. That was about three hours away. And we enjoyed going there. They had big malls, and they had amusement parks, and they had all the best restaurants. But as much as we liked to visit, we probably really wouldn't want to live there. Because for us rural folks, the city meant noise and traffic and pollution. And because they're inevitable when you have a bunch of people in the same place, that crime as well. And so why does Revelation talk about heaven as a city? Well, the city here is a metaphor. When you strip the buildings and the noise and the traffic away, cities are simply collections of people living together. And a city is a symbol of community. New Jerusalem is the community of God's people, of the church. That's why we read in Revelation 21 too, I saw the holy city, the New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. See, the city represents the people of God living together forever. The 12 gates from Revelation 21, 12 bear the names of Israel's 12 tribes. God's Old Testament people and the 12 foundations, 21, 14, bear the names of the 12 apostles, God's New Testament people. And so we see the nature of the city in its description. It's God's people, but it's also beautiful. You see, the city is made up of gold and precious stones and pearls. And then we see that it is perfect. Perfect symmetrical proportions. Have you ever heard someone say the church is imperfect because it's full of imperfect people? Well, this city, this community is perfect because it is full of perfected people, clothed with the perfection of Christ and made new and holy for all eternity. Imagine for just a second, once again, living in a community without manipulation, a community without abuse, a community without insecurity, a community without fear, a community without selfishness. I believe if we took a few moments just to think about the implications of a community like that, we would realize that way more of our life is affected by those things. Manipulation, abuse, insecurity, fear, or selfishness. Way more of our life is affected by that than we even probably realize. Imagine if it was gone. I don't know about you, but that's a city that I want to live in. But lastly, lastly, eternity is described as a new temple. Now, I know this might seem a little strange if you were paying, a little t- paying attention Earlier when I read Revelation 21, verse 22, John said he did not see a temple because the Lord God and the Lamb are the temple. But, but consider this. In 1 Kings 6, if you go there and read that, you can see the description and the dimensions of the temple built by Solomon. You have the overall dimensions. You have the dimensions of the portico out front. You have each of the different aspects of the temple. It's a fairly detailed description of Solomon's temple. But if you fast forward to Revelation 21, we see the dimensions of the city in verse 16, where it reads, the city was laid out like a square as long as it was wide. He measured the city with a rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length and as wide and high as it is long. Once again, we see this number 12,000 to be symbolic and that the dimensions are vast and complete. But notice that the city was not not only a square, but it's also as high as it is long. In other words, the city is a perfect cube. Now, I love this. <laughs> Go back to 1 Kings 6, and you look at the, the story, and you look at the dimensions and the description of Solomon's temple. There is one thing that is described as a perfect cube. It's in 1 Kings 6, starting with verse 19. He prepared the inner sanctuary within the temple to set the ark of the covenant of the Lord there. The inner sanctuary was 20 cubits long, 20 wide, and 20 high. (laughs) This inner sanctuary is what is known as the Holy of Holies, which was the temple's innermost room where God dwelled between the cherubim of the Ark of the Covenant. This was the most restricted room of the temple. Only the high priest could go in once a year 
to be in the presence of God. And what a coincidence that it has the same shape of the city of Revelation. How, what a coincidence that in 1 Kings 6, we have this perfect cube of the Holy of Holies, and then in Revelation, we have this perfect cube, which is the city, the New Jerusalem, or, or maybe, maybe it's not a coincidence at all. You see, back then, God was pretty hard to get to. It was pretty hard to be in the presence of God. It was for our own protection, but not in the new eternal temple. We read that when Jesus died on the cross, that we, in Matthew 27, Mark 15, Luke 23, that the temple curtain separating the holy of holies from God's people was ripped from top to bottom. This was God saying that no longer did mankind need to be separated from God because of our sin, because Christ paid the price for us. And through the death and resurrection of Jesus, we are able to receive God himself, the Holy Spirit, into our hearts. And so spiritually, there is no separation. But when we see the new heaven and the new earth, and when they're ushered in, our spiritual fellowship with God finds its fullness physically, finally. And God opens up the curtain to his dwelling place and proclaims the place where he lives is not just a place for God's people to visit. It's a place for them to live with him. For all eternity. Revelation 21 3. Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And so, how should we respond in anticipation of this new heaven and the new earth? What should we do knowing that the new paradise is coming, where there's no more tears, no more suffering, no more curse, no more temptation? in the presence of the Lord forever, the tree of life available to us in this beautiful city? How should we live knowing that a new city of God's people will be built, that we can dwell together with each other without manipulation or abuse or selfishness and in the presence of God? How, sh how should our lives be shaped knowing that God will welcome us into his presence through Christ, that if we have faith in Christ, if we are baptized into him, immersed in biblical baptism, showing our faith that the Holy Spirit can dwell within us, ensuring a spiritual reality that will become physical reality when the new heaven and the new earth are ushered in. Well, I think we should heed the words of Paul in Colossians 3, where he said, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your heart on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. That means we don't live here, we live for the here and now, but we live for the eternal. Church, we are to be the supermarket sample for people, for the kingdom of God. We are to give people a taste of paradise, of that community, that temple that is to come. That's, what, that's our job, is as people walk around on this earth, that we have a taste of God's intentions that we share with those we come in contact with. But it also means that we live with the hope of what is to come. You see, this is the message of Revelation, that yes, there will be suffering, but God's people are already sealed. Yes, there will be trouble, but our witness should be bold. Yes, things will get worse, but for those who persevere, the reward is coming, and the victory has already been won. And with the vision of eternity that we see in this book, as we pull back the curtain, we can press on as God's people because Jesus ends with this promise. Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. Outside of the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes to take the free gift of the water of life I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this scroll. If anyone adds to them, God will add to that person the plagues described in this scroll. And if anyone takes the words away from this scroll of prophecy, God will take away from that person any share in the tree of life in the holy city which are described in this scroll. 
He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the glimpse of the true reality that you have in store for us. Not just down the road, but right now. Because the reality of what we see in Revelation applies to us right now. We're not waiting for some date on a calendar. That date on the calendar has already been X'd out that first Easter when your son died and rose again. We can experience the promises of Revelation even as we experience the struggles even now. But Lord, we do hope for the future. And Lord, I pray that the foundation and motivation in our life will be the eternity and the promise that we have in this new heaven, the new earth, and the ushering in of your kingdom. Come, Lord Jesus, right now and for eternity. It is in his name we pray. Amen.